Welcome back. I hope you have laser-like focus for this last section because we're going to discuss laser-based and gel printers. There are two types of 3D printing that employ a laser to solidify the object they are making and that are useful for pharmaceuticals. In the first method, which is known as stereolithographic or SLA printing, objects are made from a resin and a laser is used to photo cure molecules together. The resin contains small molecules known as monomers. The resins we use are usually based on polyethylene glycol diacrylate, PEG-DA. The diacrylate groups can react and bind together when they are excited by laser energy, although we usually add a photoinitiator to help speed up the process. Because they are small, the resins are usually liquids at room temperature, so the printer holds them in a tank. When you want to print an object, a laser is focused into the resin, which causes the PEG-DA molecules to combine, creating a cross-linked polymer. As the polymer chains get bigger and bigger, they become solid. To create an object, therefore, the laser moves in a raster pattern through the resin, solidifying it to become a layer. Because the resin is a liquid, in this type of printing, the object is actually printed on the underside of the build plate. When the first layer is finished, the build plate rises and the next layer is printed. As ever, the final object is created layer by layer. Some examples of the types of printlets we make with SLA printing are shown on the screen. They are drug loaded with either paracetamol or 4-ASA. As you might imagine, the mechanical properties of the printlets are dependent upon the number of chemical crosslinks, which in turn is a function of the number of PEG-DA molecules. We can weaken the printlet by diluting the resin with a low molecular weight polymer, Typically, we use PEG-300. Because PEG-300 does not have any diacrylate groups, it cannot crosslink under the laser. The printlets on the screen were made with varying ratios of PEG-DA to PEG-300. When we measure dissolution rates from these printlets, we see that increasing the PEG-DA content decreases the rate of drug release, because there are more crosslinks as the PEG-DA content increases, which makes it harder for the drug to diffuse out. Yet again, changing the formulation allows control of the dissolution behaviour. We have done a lot with SLA printing, including printing a polypill containing six different drugs and printing hearing aids. We have also developed our own SLA printer that uses the light from a smartphone to cure the resin. It's called the Medimaker Lux and you can see it on the screen. The other type of laser printing we use is known as laser sintering. Here, a laser is used to heat particles up and cause them to fuse together. A schematic is shown on the screen. Much like the powder bed printer I mentioned earlier, I reuse the image, can you tell? A layer of powder particles is spread out, but rather than using an inkjet print head to spray a glue, a laser beam is moved over the particles in a raster pattern. The energy in the laser heats the particles up, causing adjacent particles to fuse together. Again, the laser is used to create the first layer of the object before a second layer of powder is spread out and the process repeats, exactly like the powder bed printing process we discussed earlier. Incidentally, the laser can be so powerful that even metal powder can be fused in this way, but we don't use metal particles in medicines. No one wants that sort of iron tablet. You will probably not be surprised to know that laser sintering produces weakly bound powder tablets, very similar to those made with powder bed printing, and so they also tend to be fast dispersing. On the screen, you can see some of the printlets we have made with laser sintering. Because the laser beam has a very small cross section, we can make structures with complex geometries. I showed you earlier how fast a Sprytan tablet disperses in water, so let's see how one of our printlets compares. Pretty good, I think you'd agree. And made at low cost in our own laboratory by an MSc student. The last type of printer that we use is actually the simplest to understand. And you may have seen these yourself as they are commonly used for foodstuffs, gel printing. 
Here, the material to be printed is held in a syringe. The syringe is usually heated to make the gel a liquid. This type of printer is often used to print sweets and candies or chocolate. And a motor on the print head drives a plunger down the syringe to extrude the gel. The build plate is kept cold so that the gel solidifies on contact and the object is built up layer by layer in exactly the same way we saw for fused filament printing. A massive benefit of this type of printing is that you can make chewable, fruit-flavoured tablets. These are great for children as they improve the palatability of the medicine, although I should point out, from a regulatory standpoint, there are issues with making medicines too much like sweets. Gel printing is one of the technologies that we have actually used in the clinic. We ran a small in vivo study looking to improve treatment options for children who suffer from a very rare disease, maple syrup urine disease. This is a genetic disorder, which means patients cannot synthesize branched chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase. This is a key enzyme that breaks down the amino acids leucine and isoleucine. Without it, the body has no way of metabolizing these amino acids, and so they begin to accumulate in the blood. Being acids, this means the blood starts to acidify, and left untreated, this can cause all sorts of complications and ultimately death. The only treatment option is to follow a diet that strictly restricts leucine and isoleucine. But because isoleucine is essential, a small amount of it is given as a supplement, usually in capsules hand-filled by a pharmacist. We wondered whether we could print chewable tablets containing isoleucine that might be more palatable to patients, and so we recruited four children to a pilot study. Their details are shown in the table on the screen. You might wonder why we recruited so few participants, and the answer is, it's a very rare disease, and so there aren't many children to choose from. Each child needed a different daily dose of isoleucine, and we used the gel printer to print tablets for them containing these doses. We then compared the printed tablets with the capsules. Our printer is capable of printing tablets in a range of flavours. In this case, lemon, coconut, banana, orange, raspberry and strawberry. And the actual tablets, containing a range of doses, are shown on the screen. The children took isoleucine capsules for three months, followed by printed tablets for three months. So what were the results? First up, let's look at the isoleucine concentrations of the participants in the blood. These are plotted as a scattergram on the left of your screen and as average values on the right. I think you might see that the printed tablets were able to deliver isoleucine successfully and moreover, the range of plasma concentrations achieved was tighter with the printed tablets than the capsules. Excellent. Did the children prefer printed tablets or capsules? I hear you ask. Here are the data. F is the code for a printed tablet. Let me know that. And C is the code for a capsule. And we asked each child to score how much they liked each using a simple scoring system. For each flavoured printed tablet, we gave them a corresponding capsule of the same colour. Again, I hope you can see that in the main, the chewable printed tablets were preferred over capsules, in all cases bar raspberry for some reason. I don't know about you, but raspberry is my favourite slush puppy by far. The other, less popular flavour was coconut, which I totally get. The final point I should make about 3D printing is that although there are loads of printers available on the market, none is optimised for the specific needs of the pharma industry. By that, I mean the requirement to operate to good manufacturing practice standards. So we developed our own. It's called the MediMaker and is made entirely from GMP compliant materials. It has interchangeable print heads, so it can print in various ways, including fused filament and gels. It is designed to be placed in a pharmacy and to be used by a pharmacist to print medicines for individual patients. You can find out more about it by visiting the website of Fabrics, which is the company we set up to develop pharmaceutical applications of 3D printing. I put a link to our website below. And that leaves us with the summary which is that 3D printing has many applications to personalised medicines. Clearly, it would be bonkers 
to suggest that printing will replace large-scale powder compaction as the main method by which tablets are made. It won't. Simply on cost grounds. You have to find a niche that only a printer can fill and then build a business case on that. Some that I think are feasible are shown on the screen. I hope you found our discussion of pharmaceutical printing useful and you now understand the basics of how 3D printers work. I very much hope that one day you'll find yourself in a lab with a printer developing new applications. If you enjoyed the lecture, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. It really helps promote the channel. There are loads of other lectures coming up where I will discuss some of our 3D printing work, which I hope you'll also watch. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.